Good evening. This meeting is being held pursuant to Education Order N2920, issued by Gov California Governor Gavin Newsom on March 12, 2020. Any or all board members may attend the meeting by phone. Members of the public may attend at the Fairfield Sassoon Central Office 2490 Hillborn Road, Fairfield, California, to observe and provide public comment during the meeting. Um, we have, we have John Silva. Yeah. Okay. So, um, can we have the roll call, please? Chantel Martino. No. Here. John Gott. <laughs> Judy Honeychurch. David Isom. Here. Jonathan Richardson. Here. John Silva. Here. Bethany Smith. Here. Craig Wilson. Here. Thank you. I believe uh, President Honeychurch, you have joined us. Well, she's here, but she just can't speak. Uh, Mr. Silva, could you take over, please? Uh, yes. Um, I think, uh, are we at B? Yes. We need approval for the agenda. Move approval, Bethany. Second. Second, Jonathan Richardson. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. No, we need to go. Chantel Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Okay, now we need a uh, reading of the. I'm here. Oh, okay. Judy, we're at uh, 1C. Okay, we, sorry about that. Uh, we're going to be uh, moving to closed session, adjourning to closed session for discussion and possible action on matters of student discipline, personnel, negotiations, and litigation. Any comment on closed session? There is no comment on closed session items. Okay, meeting adjourned to closed session.
Is ready? Okay, ready. Good evening. This meeting is being held pursuant to Executive Order N2920 issued by California Governor Gavin Newsom on March 12th, 2020. Any or all board members may attend the meeting by phone. Members of the public may attend the Fairfield Sassoon Central Office, 2490 Hillborn Road, Fairfield, California, to observe and provide public comment during the meeting. Board members will state their name when they make the motion and when they make the second. All votes will be recorded via roll call format. If I become disconnected, Board Vice President John Silva will run the meeting. Would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States, United States of America, America and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, we're now to on C, report of action taken in closed session. And before turning it over to our superintendent, I would like to say that um, the board um, conducted the superintendent evaluation per our board policy 2140. And it was definitely a favorable evaluation. We are all extremely pleased with her extraordinary leadership. And she has the board's complete support. And so I will now turn it over to Superintendent Corey. Thank you, President Honeychurch. In the matter of student discipline, no action was taken. In the matter with conference with labor negotiators, no action was taken. In the matter of public employment, it is my pleasure to announce that by unanimous vote, the board has officially appointed Dan Mitchell as Director of Child Nutrition effective immediately. I think it might be even effective retroactively um, because Dan, Dan has done such a great job uh, taking over for the district while, on, um, while our former director was on maternity leave and she chose to resign and uh, stay home with her kids and we're so grateful that Dan Mitchell um, is here and ready to step up. I wanna just tell you a little bit about uh, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, he ha is currently serving as the interim role of Director of Child Nutrition, using his expertise and background to efficiently and effectively serve uh, meals to our students during these very trying times. Prior to serving in this role, he held the position of Assistant Director and Child Nutrition Operations Manager in the district. The experience gained in Fairfield to soon will be coupled with 45 years of experience in both the public and the private sector to lead his department. He attended the College of the Sequoias, um, obtaining an associate's degree in the area of general business. He also holds certification as a national food safety professional and a school district nutrition specialist. He earned his bachelor's degree in business administration from Brandman University. We are so honored and thrilled to have Mr. Dan Mitchell step up and be our director of child nutrition. Congratulations, Dan. Congratulations. And then also by unanimous vote, it's my honor to announce that the board has officially appointed Shomanique Johnson as behavior um, analyst effective July 1st, 2020. Ms. Shomanique Johnson joined FSUSD from Vallejo City Unified School District where she served as a behavior coordinator. And before working in Vallejo, she served as both a behavior specialist and a behavior analyst for the San Francisco Unified School District. Sharing her knowledge of organizational leadership, applying her collaborative abilities and case management skills to necessitate early intervention. She um, earned her and her first master's of science degree in special education um, from National University. She earned her second master's of science in education for instructional technology at National University as well, and she is currently working on her doctorate. On behalf of our entire management team and the governing board, it's an honor to have Ms. Shomanique Johnson join our organization. Congratulations and welcome to Fairfield Sustainable. 
Uh, no other action was taken in closed session. Thank you, Superintendent Corey. We now move on to uh, communication information, recognition of the early college high school seniors who are receiving their associate degrees. And I will turn this over now to John Pizzo, the principal of the early college. Uh, before we turn it over to Mr. Pizzo, we do have a public uh, comment on this. Mr. Quentin Boyce has public comment. Okay. And he's the, the blue, blue bandit right there. Welcome board and superintendent. Thank you very much for recognizing these students. Um, as many of you know, I serve as president of the governing board for Solano Community College. And so I just wanted to extend and say thank you from uh, our side here at the college. I also teach for this program, so I know these students personally, and I wanted to just congratulate them and remind them and tell them that their hard work has made this program a model program that is looking at that other programs look to and uh, tried to replicate. And so um, we thank them all for their very, very hard work and congratulate them on achieving an associate's degree a few days before their graduation. <laughs> so that's pretty great. <laughs> thank you. Good to see you, Quentin. And I just wanted. And I just wanted to thank uh, Mr. Boyce for his leadership because thanks to him, we are going to expand the program next year. So I'm going to turn it, we're going to turn it over now to Mr. Pizzo. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President Honeychurch, members of the Governing Board and Community. My name is John Pizzo, and I'm the proud principal of the Early College High School Program. I am honored to present to you the early college seniors who have not only earned their high school diploma, but have completed 60 or more credits and have earned their AA degrees from Solano Community College. I'm gonna present my screen. the early college high school class of 2020 Solano College graduates. Kylie Aguan. Kylie earned her AA degrees in university studies for arts and humanities, some communications and liberal studies. Kayla Ahad. Kayla earned an AA degree in psychology and an AA in university studies Social Science. Eliza Anchetta. Eliza earned AA degrees in University Studies, Arts and Humanities, Communications, and Liberal Arts. Gabriella Biscocho. Gabriella earned an AA in Social Science, an AA in University Studies, Arts and Humanities, Communications, and Liberal Studies. Isabella Biscocho. Isabella earned an AA in General Science, University Studies, Arts and Humanities, and Science and Quantitative Reasoning. Emily Chow. Emily earned an AA in University Studies for Communications and Liberal Studies. Alexa Colobon. Alexa earned an AS in Biology an AA in University Studies for Liberal Studies for Education, Science and Quantitative Reasoning, and an AA in Interdisciplinary Studies for Science and Quantitative Reasoning. Eric Cortez. Eric earned an AA in Foreign Language for French, an AA in University Studies for Communications, and an AA in Liberal Studies. Antonio Duenas. Antonio earned an AA in general science, an AA in university studies for liberal studies, and science and quantitative reasoning. Quinton Eusebio. Quinton earned an AA in history for transfer, an AA in university studies, liberal studies, and science and quantitative reasoning. Laura Faustino. 
Flora earned an AA in General Science, an AA in University Studies for Arts and Humanities, and Science and Quantitative Reasoning. Maverick Fantano. Maverick earned an AA in University Studies for Arts and Humanities, Liberal Studies, Communications, and Science and Quantitative Reasoning. Blake Gella. Blake earned an AS in Engineering, an AA in University Studies for Science and Quantitative Reasoning, and an AA in Interdisciplinary Studies for Science and Quantitative Reasoning. Sophia Jean Knight. Sophia earned an AA in General Science, an AA in University Studies, Liberal Studies, and Science and Quantitative Reasoning. Julian Mendoza Contreras. Julian earned an AA in General Science, an AA in University Studies, Liberal Studies, and Science and Quantitative Reasoning. Julia Mercado. Julia earned an AA in General Science, an AS in Biomedical Science, an AA in Liberal Studies, Arts and Humanities, Social Science, and Communications. Jamal Nazim. Jamal earned an AA in General Science and an AA in University Studies, Science, and Quantitative Reasoning. Jacqueline Paoli. Jacqueline earned an AA in University Studies for Arts and Humanities, Social Sciences, Communications, and Science and Quantitative Reasoning. Isaac Rodriguez. Isaac earned an AA in University Studies for Liberal Studies. Jaira Sabio. Jaira earned an AA in University Studies for Liberal Studies. Ava Seward Aponte. Ava earned an AA in University Studies for Arts and Humanities, Communications, and Liberal Studies. Krishal Sharma. Krishal earned his AA in University Studies for Liberal Studies and Arts and Humanities. Sriha Srinivasan. Sriha earned an AA in General Science an AA in University Studies for Science and Quantitative Reasoning, Arts and Humanities, Communications, and Liberal Studies. Also an AA in Foreign Language for French, and AAs in Interdisciplinary Studies for Science and Quantitative Reasoning, Arts and Humanities, and Communications. Talissa Tucker. Talissa earned an AA in University Studies for Arts and Humanities, Liberal Arts, and science and quantitative reasoning. We would like to thank Solano Community College for their ongoing support and partnership. Thank you for this opportunity for me to honor these amazing early college students. Thank you. Thank you, John, for your leadership. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, yes, I, I can't believe how many AAs and uh, degrees they earned. It's just associate degrees they earned. It's just incredible. Good job, everyone. All right, moving on now to B, Superintendent's Awards, and I will be turning that over to Superintendent Corey. Thank you. And our first honoree that we are going to be recognizing is our classified uh, staff member of the year. I think you guys can all see that. Uh, Kiana Thomas, secretary to the principal, Crystal Middle School. Is she on it? Yay, you're here. <laughs> Kiana Thomas is an outstanding employee and her dedication and performance have been critical to Crystal Middle School's success. Her talent is remarkable and she utilizes her outstanding and many skills with absolute dedication and purpose for improving the lives of all who come to Crystal. She performs all of the essential functions of her job, job description and so much more. 
She effectively assists development and maintenance of school budgets and manages purchase orders and requ requisitions, manages all those accounts, but she's particularly outstanding at designing and maintaining efficient and effective organized organizational systems to ensure the advancement of all of the school's goals. She's an outstanding secretary and office manager. She's always open to new ideas and explores ways to improve efficiency and performance. She is seen as an indispensable thought partner for the administrative team and always presents as a consummate professional in confidential matters when corresponding in writing or in person or working as a receptionist in the office. Her quality of work is outstanding. She has exceptional analytical skills in every aspect of her job and produces top quality work. Her record, her record keeping organization, preparation of reports and communication, her tracking of work orders and inventories are all top quality and her work products directly result in school improvement. She has the ability to multitask many projects and manages her workflow without ever losing momentum or her enthusiasm. Her timeliness and attention to detail allow her to promptly update her supervisors, colleagues, and staff on all the various projects and operations. And she is always excellent with her written and oral communication. In particular, she has an outstanding ability to isolate the components of the given task, analyze the steps needed to obtain the objective, and then tenaciously breaks down the design, the designated objective into actionable increments. Her ability to discover, com to discover, communicate, and implement opportunities to improve methods throughout the school have been outstanding and continue to improve all the overall operations. Her constant professionalism make her an outstanding leader among all employees at Crystal Middle School. Her approach is always very reassuring to colleagues, peers, and to district staff. She ha uses excellent judgment, applies it consistently, and also communicates very clearly with all. Her abilities continue to make the administration look pretty darn good at that school, and she receives many accolade, accolades for her judgment, effectiveness, and intelligence from not only the staff with whom she works, but from also people around the district. district. Congratulations. This is a great award, and we are so proud to have you be part of FSUSD. I don't know if you want to say anything at all, Sienna. Put you on the um, spot. I just want to say thank you and what an honor it is. Um, you know, nothing ever really happens in a vacuum, and I have an amazing team at Crystal, and we also have really great support staff at the district, and they enable all of us to be successful. Well, congratulations. My next award goes to Allison Guernsey, the principal of David Beer Preparatory Academy. I think Ann Allison is on there. Got her up. I'm going to talk a little bit about Allison. Got her? There she is. Allison was hired in November of 2012 as a teacher in our district, and she served as a teacher and assistant principal, and now the principal of David Weir. Allison is one of the most organized and diligent leaders. Teachers say that they appreciate Allison because when they come to her with a question and don't get the answer that they wanted to hear, she sits with them and provides her reasoning and helps them all understand. She's fair, kind, and holds people accountable while treating them as competent professionals. She's very dedicated and puts a lot of her efforts to fulfill the needs of each individual beyond expectations. Allison makes certain everyone is included and a vital member of the team. One of her gifts is being an excellent listener. Teachers, parents, and staff always feel heard. She provides endless amounts of support. Allison is always there. Phone, text, Google Meet, Google Hangout, whenever somebody needs her, you will find her. She follows through on every email, text, and call. People never have to worry if Allison will get back to them. She promptly responds to every form of communication. 
one of the people who nominated Allison wrote, she gets it. She hears us. She sees us. I wish she would be our principal forever. She makes us all feel that we are one big family and she doesn't play favorites. All of her staff are treated equally. The staff feel the love and in turn, the students feel the love. This is Allison is more than a leader, she's a friend. She reaches out and makes sure to support not only in a professional setting, but on a personal level as well. It makes everyone's job easier. It builds respect and is important. Staff are way more willing to receive constructive advice, push themselves out of their comfort zone, and ultimately, this comes back to student success. Allison is pretty close to perfect. Alice successfully led Weir through fire threats, PG&E outage, outages, distance learning, and so many other things, and she always is focused on student achievement. We are so blessed to have someone with Allison's talent and dedication in Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm honored and humbled by this award. Um, just two years into my principalship and I feel like I just love my staff and I couldn't do it without all of them and without all of you and without all of the district staff to support me. So thank you. <laughs> I'm honored. Congratulations. Hey, hey Allison. Yes. Will you, will you take a selfie with me? I will. Do you remember my name though? I knew what you were gonna do. Hang on here. You knew it. it was, you knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. That's why I wanted to take a selfie. Good. All right. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> All right. My next award is to Val Kiha. Uh, the my choice for teacher of the year. Val on here? All right, there she is. Val was hired in 1999 and she taught economics, computer, and um, social science. Val is a get it done leader who we have um, turned to on so many occasions to support the work in the district. This past year when we decided to have admin council um, do a smaller version of the Fairfield High Almost Anything Go, goes, it was Val who worked behind the scenes to coordinate. The event would not take place had it not been for her leadership, dedication, and commitment to FSUSD. This was just one small event for her. She spends countless hours going above and beyond for the students at Fairfield High School. She makes all students feel important, valued, and loved. Val's encouragement is not only for the students, she is also seen as the go-to teacher on campus. People seek her out for advice, encouragement, and support. It is so obvious that she wants to get the best out of everyone on the campus because the students depend on it. One of the people who nominated Val stated, I cannot imagine Fairfield High without Val. She's the heart of the school. Her impact is beyond measure. Val is amazing at building relationships with students, staff, and community. She's always looking for new ways to motivate staff and students to be part of a greater community. Val is extremely organized and pays close attention to detail and deadlines. She can coordinate anything, rallies, ninth grade orientations, visits from the California Secretary of State, you name it, she'll coordinate it. Val's classroom is often a showcase classroom for teachers both in our district and from visiting neighboring districts. They come to observe teach or student-led learning in action. She is highly respected and models excellent both, excellence both inside and out of the classroom. Fairfield High is blessed to have her and Fairfield Sassoon is grateful to have someone with Val's expertise, experience, and dedication on our team. Congratulations, Val. I'd like to thank you all so much for this honor. I appreciate it. I love what I do. It's what keeps me going every day. Uh, being at home is kind of rough because I like my babies and I like to hug and whatnot. So I miss them. So again, everything I do is for our students and staff. And so I couldn't do it without them. So 
we have some great people in our district. So I'm glad to be part of your girls is soon. I'm not used to seeing you not in red. <laughs> right? And I actually had to go put the blouse on because, you know, normally. Oh. <laughs> and top and shorts. I'm like, well, Gordy and I probably should get dressed tonight. But yeah, I know this is the first time I'm not in red and black for sure. Awesome. Okay, my next award goes to Kim Morgan, our director of accounting. Is Kim on? Did she get on? There you are. There she is. So this award is um, the superintendent's award for the central office uh, staff employee of the year. And I wanna talk a little bit about Kim. Kim was hired in 2001 and has been our district accountant and director of accounting. Kim Morgan exemplifies what it means to be premier. When something comes her way that seems insurmountable, sorry, uh, that seems like an insurmountable issue, her quick response is, sure, we can do that. Kim is known for her outstanding customer service. She goes above and beyond to make things happen and is extremely accommodating to everyone. Kim takes her job very seriously and is also extremely approachable. One of the people who nominated Kim said, I have worked in other districts and have never come across someone with Kim's knowledge, expertise, thoroughness, and accessibility. Another wrote, Kim Morgan is extremely kind. She always looks at situations from the other person's perspective. She is empathetic to the needs and solves problems with more gusto than she would in solving something for herself. Kim is dedicated to, the Fairfield, to Fairfield Sassoon and has been a valuable member of the Business Services Department for many years. She also works collaboratively with other departments and is always ready to lend a helping hand. Another person stated, Kim all but brings a pillow to work. She is one of the first to arrive and the last to leave. Her commitment to the district expands beyond her job description. She is an active member of FISMA, has held various community roles, and is always ready to volunteer out in the community. Kim is one of those people who always make the other person feel important. No matter when I pop into her office, she is always willing to immediately stop what she's doing and answer my questions or help me solve some issue. I never have to worry about Kim's integrity. She's a trusted employee who works diligently without ever seeking praise for her work. She does not let her ego get in the way of her work and for as amazing as Kim is, she definitely could have an ego. Kim is one of those people who's never really satisfied. She's always looking for ways to make us better. Besides all these fabulous work qualities, Kim is a genuine, wonderful human being. This is who she is at her core. We are so grateful to have Kim Morgan, and she is so deserving of this honor. I appreciate you, Kim. Thank you. Am I on? Yes, you are. Oh, sorry, I couldn't tell. Um, I'm not used to the virtual meetings like everybody else. And I just want to thank everybody for always being supportive of me and listening. And I'm just here for our district to do the best we can. Um, I came from the private sector because I wanted a purpose. And our district has definitely done that for me. Thank you. I just want to once again congratulate this year's uh, award winners and we have a plaque to them and we will either have them uh, be able to come pick it up or we, if they can't, we will make sure that it is delivered to them. So thank you. That thank you. ends the recognition. Thank you. You have chosen some excellent awards, awardees. Uh, we now are ready to move on to B presentation, the reopening of schools for the 2020-2021 school year. And uh, do we have any public comment? Nope, there are no public comments. Then I will turn it over to Kristen Witt for presentation. 
Thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President Honeychurch, Governing Board members, and members of the public. I'm very happy to be here this evening to present to you recommendations for the reopening of schools for the 2020-2021 school year in August for Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District. Uh, please give me a moment now to pull up my presentation. We wholeheartedly support the governing board's commitment to prepare for a safe reopening of schools in August 2020. As COVID-19 continues to change our collective landscape, our district will continue to work together to leverage resources, share best practices, and advocate for regulatory flexibility, including state and federal waivers, to enable us to provide the best possible programs for all of our students. There is no one-size-fits-all approach to reopening schools. Tonight's presentation outlines for you the work of the start of the school year committee. I will highlight for you this evening the purpose of the committee, the overall committee composition and meeting dates, the considerations of the committee, and the committee's next steps. It is important to remember that these plans are subject to change as public health guidelines are updated. I would like to extend my sincere thanks and appreciation to the district staff members who are helping to develop these recommendations. A start of the school year committee was developed in early May and tasked with bringing forward a recommendation for the reopening of schools for the 2020-2021 school year. To ensure all voices were heard and to utilize our time and resources effectively, the larger committee divided into four subcommittees with the following targeted focus areas safety protocols, focusing on supplies, equipment, and cleaning. Social distancing, focusing on what social distancing would look like in the school setting. Classroom and distance learning, focusing on the educational delivery model options. And mental health, focusing on the structures and supports that will need to be in place to support the mental health needs of both students and staff. The committee began as a group of 15 members and grew to a total composition of 44 members. The growth of members on the committee was a direct response to the, to the need to have members that represented all departments and bargaining units in our district and ensure that we had experts in each area and different perspectives to truly support the committee in bringing forth the most educationally sound and safe recommendation for Fairfield Sassoon. The committee is comprised of seven teachers, one F. Suter representative, one nurse, six counselors, two psychologists, and 27 classified and certificated managers. The committee has representation from the Human Resources Department, Child Nutrition Department, Transportation Department, Maintenance and Operations Department, the Facilities Department, the Educational Services Department, which also includes special education, the Technology Support Services Department, and the Administrative Services and Community Engagement Department. As soon as the committee was formed, we met right away. To date, the large committee has met as a whole group four times. The subcommittees have met several times in between our larger meetings to revise their ideas and review updated guidance from the Center for Disease Control, Solano County Public Health, and the California Department of Education. So far, the large committee has met on May 1st, May 6th, May 11th, and May 29th, and we have our next meeting scheduled for June 12th. The committee has recognized the importance of being flexible. Guidance and parameters have changed since we began meeting and planning. We have to be ready for each upcoming phase of the governor's reopening plan and also be aware that any spikes or increases in deaths related to COVID-19 could potentially mean additional restrictions in our county. Since we started meeting in early May, our county has moved further into stage two of the governor's stages of reopening. We need to be prepared for each and every stage so that we are ready when guidance changes. Throughout our planning, it has been critical that we maintain a focus on providing a sound, equitable education while ensuring safety for all of our students and staff. I mentioned a few moments ago, we developed phases to our reopening plan, which mirrors the governor's roadmap stages. 
The Center for Disease Control has provided districts with several recommendations that would help to ensure the health and safety of staff and students. Please keep in mind that these are recommendations and not mandates. The committee has been working to review each recommendation and what that means for our operations in FSUSD. Some of the recommendations that are being reviewed include, but are not limited to, the schedules for sanitizing surfaces, schedules for our custodial staff, maps for object, object placement, identifying location for floor markers that mark off six foot radiuses, developing an ordering and ordering signage, and the plan for purchasing and stocking sufficient amounts of our cleaning supplies. It is important to note that we are reliant on our vendors to fulfill orders. We might find ourselves with a situation where a vendor may not be able to fulfill an order in a timely fashion. The committee is also reviewing and developing plans for the daily activities on our sites. We have PE teachers on our committee that are assisting in the development of a PE delivery model. We are fortunate that nearly 98 to 99% of our elementary and middle grades PE standards can be covered in a social distance environment and 85% of our high school PE standards social distance environment. We are also working on recommendations as they relate to communal spaces, such as playground equipment and multi-purpose rooms. The Child Nutrition Department has providing we can adjust our meal service delivery model to ensure a safe environment while also ensuring every student has the opportunity to a well-balanced and nutritious meal. We are committed to supporting students' social emotional wellness and offering resources to ensure students transition back to school smoothly. Support may include social emotional learning, building relationships, community building activities, and increased access to mental health and wellness services. Families and schools will need to work together to see how students are feeling and assess their individual needs to provide the support our students need during these challenging times. Quality instruction and a commitment to equity for all students continue to be the driving forces behind the success of our educational programs. At this current phase of reopening, we will need to limit the number of students on campus. In order to maintain social distancing, we are reviewing several different options. We are evaluating each of our different classroom configurations and what the furniture setup would be to allow for social distancing within the classroom setting. We are developing our education delivery models that support social, social distancing. One option is a hybrid in-person and distance learning. One option staggers the days of the week that students attend. Another option staggers the days of the week and ends with a grab and go lunch structure. And one option incorporates block scheduling and stagger days of the week for secondary schools. We are still receiving feedback from both staff and families, and we will use that feedback as we decide on the best delivery model for the opening in August 2020. A key component included in each of the educational options is maintaining what is referred to as stable cohorts of students. In essence, it mirrors a family structure where students are around the same cohort of, cohort of students each time they are in school. This limits the amount of people each student comes in contact with. Flexibility will continue to be a need as schedules may change during the year based on guidance from the Center for Disease Control, California Department of Education, and the Solano County Public Health Department. The committee is also working on the recommendations for school transportation. We are reviewing routes, drop-off times, procedures for parents, and feasibility of social distancing on the school bus. We currently transport a little over 600 students each day during the school year, and over 70% of the students we transport have transportation in their Individualized Education Plan, or IEP. The committee has done a lot of work, but we do still have more to complete. I will share with you now some of our next steps. The superintendent sent an email letter to all families on Monday, June 1st, updating families on the options for the 2020-21 school year and, and included a link to a survey for prioritization of some of the recommendations discussed in tonight's presentation. A hard copy of that letter in both English and Spanish is going out in the U.S. mail tomorrow. We will close the survey on Monday, June 15th. The committee will review and analyze feedback from the parent and guardian survey. As of tonight's board meeting, we have received over 2,300 responses on the English survey and 86 responses on the Spanish survey. School sites are including the link in this, to the survey in their communication home to families so that we can get as many responses as possible. 
The committee will finalize its recommendations for the opening of school in August 2020. And I will return to the governing board on June 18th, 2020 to present the committee's final recommendations. A virtual town hall for questions and answers is being planned for June 23rd at 6 p.m. This will allow members of the community to submit questions in advance and have their questions answered during the virtual town hall. The committee will also develop infographics that explain the phases of reopening, which will include the reasoning behind the stages and the actions that are included in each stage. The committee will develop signage for our campuses that provides information on proper hygiene practices. Lastly, human resources will engage in negotiations with each of our affected bargaining units, CSCA, FSUDA, and APA. I wanna thank you very much for your time this evening. And now it is time for board discussion. President Honeychurch, before board discussion, I just wanted to add a couple of things. First of all, I wanted to just thank Kristen and her leadership on coordinating all of this. Um, there's been a lot of work that's gone into it. You can see from all the committee mm -hmm. members and really analyzing every avenue. Um, but just some of the things just for the board to understand and actually for the public as well. To date, we still have not received waivers um, in regards to instructional minutes or instructional days. So a lot of these things um, that we're planning, you know, we still have to ensure that uh, the state gives us permission to uh, potentially do uh, less than a full day of instruction or maybe um, split days or uh, alternating days. The other thing is one of the, the big key factors is about cleanliness and um, ensuring that our schools get clean. And we did do an analysis and um, some of our schools were on an every other day basis for uh, cleaning. And so just to uh, ensure that we would have all of our classrooms cleaned every single day means that we would have at minimum need to hire five additional full-time custodians, and then we would also need to um, hire additional itinerant substitute custodians because um, we do have a lot of absenteeism among staff. And so um, just wanted to talk about that because we do have a conversation about budget upcoming, but um, one of the things is that we know is uh, working in COVID times is causing an increase of expenditures not only with personnel, but also, you know, devices and hotspots and things like that, that we have um, also had to increase. So just wanted to share those things before any board discussion. Thank you. Any comments from board members? David. Yeah, I want to just ask Chris about um, ADA. My, 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 my concern with our budget, I know we're going to hear the report of the budget soon, my concern, I guess it's not a question, it's, I, get, I think I'm expressing as concern, is how many students uh, have, are, we, are we projecting, right, enrollment? I was talking to some parents, just bumping into them. Um, yesterday, I spoke to one regarding this reopening schools, and, and the concern I had, we shared, was the enrollment numbers, which is going to directly impact our budget as well. When will we know the enrollment numbers? When, when, when do we know who's enrolling and do we know two things? Do we know when, when, when is enrollment? And then the second question I have is students that decide to go to school virtually outside of our district, like these virtual schools, we don't receive um, support for that. Is that correct? That's correct, and that's one of the reasons why we developed our vir own virtual school. And so we've okay. already had an, a number of students who have uh, registered for our virtual school, and we're Good. also promoting okay. our secondary independent study for those um, students in ninth through 12th grade who don't feel comfortable coming back to school. But they, they are, have already given us guidance on being held harmless for uh, ADA for next year. So what that means, what we're hearing is, no matter what our ADA is next year, um, that will be the calculation for our um, apportionment and funding. So, um, and as far as enrollment is concerned, what uh, we have had our um, elementary 
uh, secretaries and clerical folks reach out and literally call every individual, and we're still in the process, to, to talk about whether they plan on coming back in the fall. Um, and secondary is also uh, working on that project. What we're, we're finding is, um, we had this conversation on Tuesday at Cabinet, is people also have just moved. They've moved out of the um, area. And, you know, we don't know why. We could guess that maybe, you know, when you lose your job, you need to relocate and move in with other family members or whatnot. We're not sure. Um, but enrollment is going to be harder to predict this year than any other year. Um, and so we hope that, you know, and, and we have a lot of parents who are reaching out and aren't willing to make a decision right now. They still kind of want to see how this whole thing plays out. And they have a lot of questions and a lot of concerns before they will make those final decisions. And so it, it has been, as I think one of the things that spoke loudest of the presentation is our plan has to be flexible and nimble enough that we can adjust accordingly um, should things change or should enrollment change or uh, should our guidance change. Okay, thank you. I reserve okay. the balance of my time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Mr. Isom, uh, I John, would like to ask a question. Uh, okay, Joan. Uh, Chris, can you explain again about our ADA? Is the is the upcoming year going to be based on this last year? Yes, that's yes, that's what we're hearing. That this upcoming year will be based on last year's ADA, so we will be held harmless. Thank you, thank you. I didn't quite understand. Thank you. Okay. John, okay. did you uh, have a question or a statement? Yes. Yes. Are you talking to me? Yes, uh, John. John Silva. Okay. John Silva. Uh, I, I have a I have a couple of them. Uh, you know that that we need to see how this uh, plays out. There are only uh, there are only so many options for this to play out because for one, students do have to go to school. Now maybe they'll have more options to go to school elsewhere, but elsewhere means what? Uh, virtual with private companies or virtual with our district or what go away to some other state where they're having less problems than we are and we're not having that many problems so i'm, I'm not sure how that kind of plays in that you know where people are moving out where are they moving to i mean i, I understand these are things we don't have answers to but um i, I guess if i were going to move away I'm, where would i move away to i mean right. I, I i think if i had to move out momentarily it, I would find somebody local that I know to live with as opposed to move to Montana where I don't know anybody. And, you know, I can't imagine all of our families are from Montana or from Georgia or wherever. But um, we don't know. We we just know that they've moved out of the district. OK. And uh, well, if they've moved out, they've moved out. <laughs> we have nothing we can do about that. Maybe we can coax them back in. But we've gotten twenty three hundred responses to our uh, survey. But uh, it, you know, we have 22,000 students, but I'm assuming these are families that have responded. So we have actually, if they're families that have responded, then it actually represents more than 2,300 students. It might represent 8,000 students or 5,000 students because we're- Right, so it's a higher people proportion. have more than one child. Yeah. Right, correct, uh, three or four maybe. So, you know, we may be getting a higher response than you think. We don't know, I don't know how many families there are. Maybe there are only 5,000 families in the district. And so we've heard from at least half of them so far. Um, and then in, in the in this, you know, personal safety equipment stuff, you know, we keep hearing about social distancing, but I have not heard anybody mention about masks, uh, which of course are more effective than anything else, if worn half properly, I guess. So has any of these do any of these plans consider uh, the use of masks? Uh, yeah, one of the yes, one of the questions on the survey included uh, the wearing of masks, and mm -hmm. it actually um, it, the parents or the people who responded uh, did feel pretty strongly about the adults on the campus for sure wearing masks. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, but anyway, that's just uh, yeah. I, I assume that we would have to have some kind of feedback on whether students would wear masks, the teachers, whether adults. Or, or anybody, you know, is, is it left up to a family whether they should wear a mask? You know, I, I don't know, but I think I think we have to obviously figure out. Um, 
And then if, if we're talking about 80, I realize that we're doing completely different things here and maybe it could be even in shifts, but if 80% to 85% of our student population, you know, can be accommodated by social distancing, I guess the question is, uh, since possibly we have fewer students, does, do, will that involve all of the students? Or are there 20% there to 15% that we can't account for? In other words, what are they, they can't come to school if they're social distancing because they're not in a room to uh, social distance 100%. Uh, I don't know, just, these are just all loose thoughts that were coming up as I was listening to the presentation. Yeah, a social distancing is a problem, you know. I mean, even if even if we wanted to, our classrooms aren't large enough to accommodate, you know, all of the students in an, and then social distance at six feet apart. Um, and also just people are social human beings. And, um, you know, we see that any time that there's some type of gathering, um, people just want to get close to one another, and so social distancing will be uh, will be a challenge. Yeah, well, you know, and these aren't things that I'm saying are, I don't know, make it or break it. They're just they're obviously challenges that we're going to face, and somehow we have to accommodate for them. Or, you know, we, we I don't think we have a choice to turn a blind eye. Um, I don't know. That's all I had. Just kind of a uh, loose thoughts on, on some of this stuff. Thank you. Judy, if I might. Oh, you're muted. So I'm going to assume that you're saying yes, I may go ahead. <laughs> um, I just, I want to say that I'm, I'm grateful that uh, mental health and the social emotional aspect is being um, looked at uh, so heavily and by looking at this about uh, you know, people's safety from COVID, but just the mentality that they're going to come back into these classrooms with, and, you know, it's not just this. And that's been a big concern of mine is, you know, I'm witnessing my own child and just humanity as a whole and seeing how people are struggling with coping with such a, a separation from society uh, and, and one another and forgetting how to do those interactions. And, um, you know, I think for our younger kids, it's going to be even harder than the older ones. Um, you know, but uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that that's such a big focus. Um, can I ask, and you may not have this information uh, handy right now, but um, Kristen was saying how many uh, surveys had been completed in the different formats. Do we have a number on how many were sent out in those different formats? And how they were sent out. Chris, you muted yourself. Sorry. We are mailing tomorrow one to every uh, child family member, every parent. So that's um, well over 22,000 that we're mailing out um, tomorrow. And then we sent an email to every parent that was um, identified in Aries. So it was th those were pushed out. And then we are also going to be sending a additional survey to our staff members as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Bethany. That was my question um, as well. And I'm hoping that with the additional survey sent out that we'll get more responses from our Spanish speaking population. Any other comments? Yeah, I do. I, that's why I reserve the balance. I just really want to hear some more. The, the, the quick question I have is if if we do morning and afternoons, okay, because I know that's an option. So if a, if a parent has kid, two kids, will we make sure that, that those kids go in the same time? Is that, you know, I know, I know there's a team looking yeah. at it. But... Yeah, and that's one of the things that we were talking about. In fact, um, Dr. McCabe brought up that one of the recommendations is, is actually, you know, you don't do uh, the – split days by alphabet, but maybe by neighborhood and address 
So all these people in this address go at that same time. And it helps for a couple of reasons, because then if there should be an outbreak, it's, it's you know where contained. it's contained. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, they're considering all of those options. Cool. Huh. All right. Wow. And, 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 okay. Thank you. I'm done with this. I, I have one more comment. Sure. John. Uh, and, and this is not a question at all. I'm, I'm just, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed and, you know, thankful that uh, Kristen Witt and her team can even put this together. I can't even imagine how much monumental work this is yeah. uh, from scratch. I can't imagine what our LCAPs are going to look like. I mean, they're going to have to change radically. Uh, <laughs> these are all different, completely different priorities. But uh, it, there are so many things to look at. If you do a, a split shift, I mean, our teachers only have so many hours. And you can't split 50-50 because they'll be teaching twice so many hours if we had the same amount of teaching hours, I mean, instruction. But obviously, they're, they're not going to have the same amount of instruction. If the teacher teaches seven hours, it, I guess the student's only going to get three and a half hours. And then another half will get three and a half hours also, or, or the teachers won't survive. Uh, but anyway, I just, I just can't even imagine the monumental task that Kristen Whitty put together with this in, in a short time. Because this has got to be, I mean, I, I know it from scratch. I, I taught a class one time in the first year. It was, it had never been taught. And the amount of work I had to do the first year was was incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, just to come up with all the, the lesson plan, it was it was a lot, a lot, a lot of work. And, and that was just one class. I mean, this is an entire district of students. And right now it has questions, you know, that still have to be, figured out and answered and and then by the time we implemented it they have to be i would i don't want to say perfected but certainly they have to be ironed out to the point where we think we have bu the bugs out of it so i don't know i i really like to get a shout out to her and her team that this is uh i can't even imagine this task I'm just, I'm and this is all also in addition to keeping school running because remember school is still in progress planning for graduations and promotions and all of those other tasks on top of everything else. So you're right, it's, it's been <laughs> monumental work. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> May I ask another question, please? Yes, and then Jonathan. Um, I, I am concerned about something that, that David said a minute ago. Um, are we looking at doing split days? as in morning, afternoon? Because I don't know how you could get the classroom cleaned, all those classrooms cleaned in time to add a second half. Is that something yeah, that's it, being looked at, or is that not it, being looked at? It's one of the considerations that it, that have, people have been asking us to uh, consider. So it is one of the considerations that we agree with you, uh, Ms. Scott. It would, it, I mean, it's already difficult to clean a classroom in the time that we have in the evening um, to make sure every classroom is clean for the next day. So it it would be uh, pretty pretty difficult to clean midday and then also at the end of the day. Thank you. Jonathan? Yeah, so I, I am interested, um, one, in knowing a couple of things. Uh, Madam Superintendent, if you don't have this information, it's not critical. Um, but I'm a little concerned about what, how we're sending information out because sometimes we send out literature and everything looks the same. And I'm not sure if when we send out this information to 20, 20,000 plus individuals, um, if it will just be kind of like a bill in the mail for lack of better terms. Um, so I, I really, really want to just say, I think that it's important for us to start converting what we are doing that way into digital and maybe looking at a cost analysis of whether it's more effective and cost effective to run a television campaign where people would see it um, virtually and be prompted because now it's being presented in a new way and however the language is presented um, because again um, we mail out things I'm not sure how often but uh, a letter in the mailbox uh, in this day, 2020, is not as impactful as now um, a series of videos that we could release, um, as well as 
um, looking at that cost uh, through Comcast Spotlight or seeing if they would partner with us based on the fact that we're trying to adjust academically. So I think it's something worth considering for the sake of a cost savings um, and also considering which families absolutely need to receive mail because that's the way that they communicate opposed to us just sending it to everyone in the hope that people look at it. So um, I'm just thinking if we've already converted into a virtual learning environment, why are we still looking at physical delivery methods um, when now we have pretty much the attention of a lot of people digitally? But those are good suggestions. And we did send it out electronically and put it out on social media. Um, and you're right, the cost is is large to do our mailing. Um, I think it was over $9,000 for us to do that. So um, these are some good suggestions. Yeah, and, and if we have the, uh, the parent leaders, um, it may be an opportunity for them since, you know, they're connected. Um, I don't want to create a lot of work for our um, public relations team, for lack of better terms, but it might be good since those individuals are faces of leadership in the community already that you meet with um, quite frequently throughout the year to help with different sites. It might be a good idea if we can put together um, video content to encourage people to participate in surveys because they may have a better connection with the community than we do as the main district office uh, because of how frequently they communicate with that stakeholder base. So if it's, if it's whether, whether it's just coordinating a time for them to just do a very, very brief 30 second, one minute video petitioning for those individuals in their specific areas to participate in the survey and leverage the technology to make sure that the URL for the survey is actually in the video so they can click the video and be directed to the survey. I think that those are some efficient ways that we may get more of a response than the smaller responses that we have historically received um, in our survey attempts. Thank you, Jonathan. Craig. And I uh, endorse what Jonathan said. I would support spending more money to study our communication channels and find more ways to communicate better. Um, I think that has great value. Thank you, Craig. Any other Can comments? I make a comment about this also? Joan, say that again. Can I make a comment also, please? Yes. Um, I'm assuming that Comcast still has something called public access and that's free or it was free unless something has changed because they have to negotiate that contract with the city. So I would think that that would be a lot less money if we put together a spot like what Jonathan was suggesting and put it out on Comcast. At least it's worth finding out about. Absolutely that would be, but the disadvantage of that is that 90% of people do not go to that channel. So it would, it would probably be, um, if we're gonna spend the money and if it's beneficial to us, we might as well go mainstream where people, I mean, I don't think we've ever been seen on television like that. So it would actually probably spike um, the level of interaction because of all oh, the school districts on TV, um, the superintendent or whoever it may be um, asking for people to complete a survey because again, in the climate that we're in, there's been a lot of changes. They've not heard from us a lot as far as what we're trying to do for, 20, uh, for this new school year. But for them to see us in a redefined way, I think is extremely meaningful and it shows for us. I mean, we're FSUSD. What have we not done that other people haven't done or can't do yet? And we continue to innovate. And I think that, again, we may not do this, but I think it's worth us considering if we're trying to reach the new dimension of communication through the channels that are available to us. I would agree, Jonathan. I would agree. Okay, any other comments? Uh, I'll know. just, you know, along, okay, the lines John? Of, uh, along the lines of, of the, the cable companies, you know, maybe we could go to them and ask them if they would give us some free air time. I mean, this is not like a normal thing, you know, maybe they could, they'd be willing to give us some free primary time that's not on a localized channel, but over the 
you know, normal airwaves and do some short spots for people to look for the survey if nothing else, or, you know, whatever we're trying to communicate with. And maybe they could be, those spots could be made by the, rather than, you know, anybody in the school district, maybe they could be made by the most popular student and more people would be willing to watch it. At least the word, the word was certainly get around quicker than one of us did it or anybody probably in our organization. Anyway, that's just a thought. Okay, thank you, John. All right, moving on now uh, to see employee uh, organization reports. Do we have any reports, uh, Ms. Corey? Nope, there is no report. Okay, and I will go on to D, a student board member report. Chantel Martino, do you have a report? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, all. To start off my report, I would like to say that I read over the student board member handbook, which I feel was very informative. I would like to thank Mr. Cortez for providing guidance and helping me as I learned the ropes to this position. Secondly, Ms. Pierce has signed both Mr. Francisco and me up for the student board member symposium on July 1st, and I'm very much looking forward to that. And lastly, if it hasn't yet been brought up to the attention of the board and to FSUSD, I would just like to address what I've been reading on Twitter in regards to students within FSUSD who have been victims of sexual assault and harassment. I'm not sure about other schools, but Armio High School is aware of the current situation. I don't think this is a topic that should be taken lightly, and I believe that the district should take action to acknowledge what's been going on. A student stated this yesterday to the FSUSD Twitter. Your students get raped, groped, sexually assaulted, and harassed in your schools. You need to teach these boys at a young age. Teach them basic morals, that silence is not yes, that coercion is not yes, that stop is not yes, that no is not yes. Do something. I was talking to students and teachers from my school and they suggested creating a club to provide awareness to these issues and to help others, as well as to improve campus culture. Others suggested that a class be made or to incorporate it into a curriculum. Someone also suggested that an assembly be made to address these issues and to advocate for and educate people on this topic. I feel that we should approach this in a safe and supportive way. As a student, I believe that the voices and the well-being of my peers classmates and fellow students should be heard and that we as a district should hear them, listen to them, offer help to them and educate others on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Chantel. Uh, moving on to superintendent's report. Thank you. And yes, Chantel, we are aware of the Twitters and um, our administration uh, that as we speak. Uh, my report, I wanted to mention that Kristen Sulsby is a PE teacher at Fairview, and she was invited to join the California Subject of Physical Education and Health in the Bay Area select, um, section. This is a really big deal in PE, and um, she accepted the invitation about six months ago, and not many of our uh, physical educators get invited to be part of the group of best practitioners, um, and Fairfield is so lucky to have this profession or this passionate educator in our midst. Um, Cindy Letterer also was one that served on that. And so we're really excited that uh, Kristen is also participating. I did want to just briefly talk about the numbers. Uh, Kristen Witt did mention that um, how many we had of the surveys. And so as of noon today, we had uh, 23, uh, 2,376 people completing our survey. And um, of those the highly important things were things like uh, providing meals with social distancing, mandated temperature checks at home, staggering our school days, students making sure they had their own supplies, no one else um, permitted in the classroom but the teacher and the student, uh, highly recommended that staff wear masks and that um, students wear masks, and then um, hand washing, of course, and hand sanitizing. And so those were those are coming up as very important um, from our parent point of view. I just wanted to give a shout out to our previous past, our past president, David Isom, for his leadership in the community. 
Kentucky helped to organize an amazing event yesterday at Laurel Creek uh, Park. It was about an hour of uh, prayer and our community coming together to talk about injustice. And um, it was this, it was so well done, and it was really uh, great to be part of it. And so I wanted to thank David for his leadership in making that happen. There's um, a lot going on. We have next week our virtual or our um, video graduation ceremonies, and so you've all been sent invitations to those, and so you could spend a whole day watching our uh, video graduations, and they're proven to be a big deal. That's not next week. Sorry, that's the following week. Next week is our last week of school, and so um, people are making plans. Unfortunately, some of our plans this week, we had students that were coming to pick up their personal belongings, but because of some of the things that were happening in our community, we really ask that people uh, work from home as much as they could this week until things calm down a little bit. But that ends my report. Thank you very much, uh, Superintendent Corey. Uh, before going on to public comment, I would like, if I may, please go back to 3D. Um, I did have an opening statement, which I skipped over. And I would like to share um, a statement written by uh, Jonathan Richardson, a board member, that I believe really excellently and clearly expresses uh, the board's goals and beliefs for our district during um, this unusual time. And so if I may, I'd like to read it. The Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District strives to constantly provide the highest level of academic support and achievement with fair and balanced equity for our students. In light of the current civil matters, which have impacted local, national, and global communities, we, the members of FSUSD, do not condone or support any behavior which creates division or the lack of equity for our students. As we, pardon me, as we proudly serve our diverse community, we continue to focus on an inclusive and innovative approach to our role as leaders in the educational community. As we continue to navigate, our primary goal remains to develop resilient students who embrace and respect the differences of others. FSUSD continues to be a proactive partner in the community building relationships with various businesses and nonprofit organizations that help to enrich the quality of our overall students' learning experience. We are a beacon of hope and inspiration to all of our students who believe we will be the change that we need in the world of the future. Thank you. Now we'll move on to public comment or public communication. Uh, this is the, op which is uh, 5A. This is the opportunity for the public to address items that are not on the board meeting agenda. Public comment is only permitted on matters within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Do we have any public speakers? Yes, we do. George Gwynn. George. Good evening. Good evening once again. I can uh, see a tsunami coming. Um, you have uh, too many negative things happening all at one time. Uh, you um, have a uh, taxation system where California is uh, the highest tax state in the nation as far as schools are concerned. Uh, you um, have um, a very volatile situation with the COVID-19 situation, so you don't know exactly how many people are going to be coming back. I've, I've seen on television where the students that are coming back and moving to Florida or other states because of sports. I think it's probably going to be the same thing with um, some people as far as the education level. Maybe they don't um, like the type of uh, instruction they're getting. Um, it, um, is um, also a problem that uh, the um, state is considering having a split role for the property tax. I went uh, to a virtual meeting today um, at the Taxation Revenue Committee uh, meeting. They think they're going to get more uh, tax money that way, but what's probably going to happen is there's going to be lawsuits, and the lawsuits are um, 
going to eat up a lot of money. Plus, also, it's going to take time to get the assessors to where they can reappraise the property. So it doesn't look uh, too good in that level. Um, it seems to me what you really need to be considering is uh, cutting your expenses. Um, you have uh, a lot of people making over 100 or 150,000 a year. I think 100, 150,000 a year is enough for a lot of people to get by. And um, there's a lot of people in the private sector who lost their jobs. So um, something you need to be thinking about as far as um, having any kind of stability as to the budget. That if you keep going like you're going, it's, it's towards bankruptcy. It's not going to uh, work um, like it has in the past. This is really uh, a different uh, set of conditions than, than what it was. Um, I think uh, the sooner you do things to stabilize things, the better. Um, you got uh, unfunded liability with the pension program. That's something that needs to be worked on. But the, the biggest thing is you need to get the expenses under control as far as uh, what you already have on the table. Because in addition to what you've had in the past, you're going to have uh, more expenses. Plus, uh, also you're getting less revenue from uh, the state. So it's like I said, it's a tsunami. It's an unbelievable amount of stuff that you have to uh, to deal with. And uh, if you don't come up with good answers, then it's uh, not going to be a good outcome. So um, I really hope that um, you consider about uh, making some. Uh, cuts first before it's too late because it's easier to do things ahead of time and it gives you more uh, time to improve. If you don't do that, then it goes the other way. Looks like the time is about up for this time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. 6A, do we have any items to be pulled from the consent calendar? Okay, or do we have any public comment on the consent calendar? Move approval. There's no. No public comment. Thank you. Move Second. approval. Second from Jonathan. First was David Isom. Uh, roll call, please. Chantal Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Trudy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. All right. Moving on to action items 12A. We have the public hearing for resolution number 67 1920, resolution of the governing board to grant a con conservation easement to, I won't pronounce this right, Yoka Dehe Wintun Nash Nation for purposes of designating a cultural value to a portion of property located 1634 Rockville Road. No presentation, any public comment? All right. The public hearing is open. No public. Public hearing is closed. Thank you. Uh, going on to B, review and potential approval of said resolution. Do we have any, uh, may I have any discussion on this item? Okay, may I have a motion? Second. Bethany, and second from where? Who? Joan Gott. Joan Gott, thank you. Uh, roll call. Chantal Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. C, review and potential approval of resolution number 66, 1920, requesting bridge loan in anticipation of funds which will accrue to the district during the fiscal year. There's no presentation. Do we have any public speakers? There are no public Move speakers. Approval. Move approval. Okay. Uh, before, Joan Gott. Thank you, Joan. Any discussion on this at all? Okay. Second. Second, Bethany. Thank you. Roll call, please. Chantal Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Sorry. Bethany Smith. 
Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. Moving on to D and E. These are both um, review and potential approval of award bids. D is award bid 20F154, asphalt repairs at Grange Middle School to DRT Grading and Paving Incorporated. E is awarded FRP 2086-20-21, tutoring services to Sylvan Learning and Tutor Me Education. Um, do we have any public comment on these two items? No public comment. Any discussion? May I have no, a motion no. to approve? John Gott, Gott. move approval. Second. Jonathan. Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Chantal Martino. Aye. Joan Kopp. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. Moving on to 13, A and B are both um, common occurrences. A is uh, resolution number 54, 1920, authorizing employment of an instructor to teach on a provisional internship permit. And B is um, resolution number 55, 1920, authorizing, authorizing instructors to teach on a variable term waiver. Do we have any public comments on either of these? No public comment. Okay, any discussion? May I have a motion to approve both A, 13A and B? Move, Move approval. approval. Okay, Joan Gott. Jonathan, will you be a second? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, roll call. Chantal Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. I would like other people to make motions. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. Moving on to 14A, review and potential approval of resolution 56, 1920, specifications of the election order for a consolidated board member election. There is no presentation. Any public comment? There is no public comment. Any discussion from the board? Okay, may I have a motion to approve? Move approval. Second. David Isom. Second, uh, John Silva. Yep. Roll call, please. Chantal Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, that motion carries. Uh, items 14B through F, I'm going to turn over to Jonathan Richardson, who is the chairperson of the uh, Governance Subcommittee. Jonathan. Thank, thank you, Madam President. Uh, the items that are before you board colleagues are what we covered in the Governance Subcommittee on May 20th. These are suggested changes, new policies by CSBA or recommended deletions. Um, we carefully reviewed these in the government subcommittee, made the necessary changes to make sure that they match our district. And I now present items 14, B, C, D, E, and F for your review and approval. In B, there was a typo and it should say use USE. Okay, so if the motion could be to approve said items with the corrected typo. So moved, John Gott. Second, Bethany. Thank you, roll call please. Chantel Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. 
Moving on to 15A, review of the 2020-2021 uh, single plans for student achievement. And do we have any public comment on this item? No public comment. Thank you. I will turn it over to Sheila McCabe. Good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President, Heather Church, and members of the Governing Board. State and federal law requires Title I comprehensive school improvements and additional targeted school improvement schools to annually update their single plan for student achievements, also known as the SIPDA. Because this is an effective process in reviewing school data and developing plans, all schools in the Saratoga Spring Unified School District create a SIPDA annually. The SIPSAs are reviewed by the School Site Council and the School English Learner Advisory Committee prior to being presented to the Governing Board. The items are being presented tonight as information and will be coming back to the next board meeting for action. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any comments from the board? All right. B, review of the COVID-19 operations written report. Um, do we have any public comment on this item? No public comment. Okay. Again, Sheila McCabe. Good evening again, everybody. And give me just a moment while I pull up my report. So good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President, Honey Church, and members of the Governing Board. In compliance with Executive Order N 5620, when that was put in place earlier this year, it adjusted the timelines for the Local Control and Accountability Plan, also known as the LCAP, as well as established the requirement for each um, school district to create, adopt, and communicate with stakeholders a COVID-19 operations written report. Tonight, we're presenting you with the draft of the written report. And again, it'll come back at our next governing board meeting for action. There are five components that the report needs to respond to. And it's very interesting because the state really does want this to be a relatively brief report. In fact, the recommendation is in any one prompt, we don't answer in more than 300 words. As you do read the prompt, you'll notice that we have exceeded that in certain cases. And it's really because there's important information of, of the um, actions and services that we've been able to provide our students and community that it's important that we were able to tell as part of this um, report. They've asked for us to give an overview explaining the change of the program as a result of COVID-19 and a description of how we're meeting the needs of our English learners, such as um, pushing out lessons, daily to ensure that our children are getting the 30 minutes of designated instruction or meeting the needs of our low income students, such as through the work that's happening with our family resource centers. It also includes an overview of changes to, oops, it also includes information about our um, distance learning program, as well as how we've been providing meals to our children and community. In fact, to date, we're almost close to 225 thousand meals that have been served to our families during this time of COVID-19. Um, in terms of the distance learning piece of it, I'm extremely pleased to include there not only the work of educational services, but the, the great work of a technology support services department to ensure our families and our staff have access to technology and when there's issues, they're able to get those resolved with our drive-through services that we're providing at the school site. And finally, the, the, um, the written report includes a description of the steps that have to be taken to arrange for supervision of students um, during the school day. And we are very blessed. That's been an activity that's been taken on by Solana First Five and in our community also through the Cox Center um, in order to provide that support. As indicated, the, the written report has to be adopted before July 1st and submitted with our budget when it is submitted to the Solana County Office of Education. Um, and then it also needs to be posted on our website and Solano County Office of Education will post it on their website. So we will be bringing it back to our next meeting for the board to be able to potentially approve. As a reminder, in terms of changes with the LCAP and um, board member Silva, I appreciate your comments early on in terms of how the LCAP might look different. We couldn't be um, more accurate in that statement. We will have a new LCAP, a one-year LCAP that will be in due in December. And then we have a three-year LCAP that will be due a year from now. 
That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, do we have any board discussion on this item? Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, moving on to 16A. We have a public hearing for the proposed 2020-2021 budget and reasons for assigned and unassigned ending fund balances. Sorry. Above. Pardon me? Did I miss something? Sorry, yes, C. Oh, I forgot. Oh, pardon me. No, I thought we just did see. Review of we 20. See, but C is just no presentation, but there, just in case there's any, there's no public comment, but just in case there's any um, board discussion. Right, I'm sorry. C, is there any board discussion on this item? Okay, now we move on to 16A. Public hearing for the proposed 2020-2021 budget and reasons for assigned and unassigned ending fund balance above the minimum recommended reserves. No presentation, any public comment? Public hearing is open. Public hearing is closed. Thank you. B, presentation of this said draft. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Linnea Grindle. Thank you and give me just a moment to share my screen. Good evening, Board President Honeychurch, Governing Board and Superintendent Clory. Tonight I present to you the proposed budget for 2020-2021. So this budget is based upon the governor's May revised budget proposal. And once the state adopts its budget, any changes in which we hope there will be many will be adjusted within 45 days of that adoption. Starting with the revenue assumptions, the May revise did include a cost of living adjustment in the local control funding formula of 2.31%. However, due to the downturn in economic factors as a result of the shelter in place orders that we've been living under for the last couple of months, a deficit factor of 10% was applied on top of that, effectively reducing our local control funding formula revenues by 7.92%. We budgeted any federal categorical revenues at 0%, and most state categorical programs also received a 10% reduction. The budget is based upon the best known information that we have at this time with an enrollment projection of 21,305, which is a very slight modest increase over the enrollment that we currently are experiencing in 1920. And of course, as we had stated earlier, uh, enrollment will be one of those factors that, that is quite volatile, but given anything else, we are remain expected to remain flat over the next five years. Listed before you here are the staffing assumptions that we use to build the budget. They are based upon formula. And salaries do include any budgeted spec and professional growth increases. Statutory benefits are budgeted per the latest rates available. And in the May revise, there was some relief in the percentages that we pay the employer share of our CalPERS and CalSERS retirement systems. And then all other expenditure budgets are based upon formula. Our categorical programs, including those that do reside in other funds, are budgeted to be in balance. So when the May revise proposal came out, um, as we know, it had significant budget reductions to education. And essentially, staff was tasked to incorporate that large revenue reduction and provide to you this evening a balanced budget in less than two weeks. So this slide 
goes through the steps that we took to be able to provide that balanced budget. Uh, we were looking at about $18.5 million that we needed to work with. So we suspended the transfers to save for post-employment benefits, economic uncertainties to beef that up, uh, future textbook adoptions, safety and security upgrades, and playground equipment replacement. Then we had to move over to what we could reduce. We did reduce our technology replacement allocations and reduced our deferred maintenance transfer by a quarter percent. We looked to see what kind of a salary budget savings we could achieve for future vacant and substitute positions and then finally had to reduce department and site budgets. After all of the reductions were made, we still needed to uh, balance by transferring in some of those set asides that we had been saving for. So anything above the required 3% minimum that sits in fund 17, we transferred back to the general fund. A large portion of the funding that we've set aside to pay for post-employment benefits and fund 20 was transferred back. And then a portion of our future textbook adoption set aside that also resides in fund 17 was transferred into the general fund, allowing us to present a balanced budget in the general fund for 2021. Uh, we still are required to maintain a 3% minimum in our economic uncertainties fund, which is budgeted to be $7 million, and that is exactly what we have sitting in Fund 17. And then as we know that that amount does not even cover a month of our average payroll expenses. We are in the business of people, as evidenced by this graph, and over 85% of our budget, and that is very normal across school districts, are made up of salary and benefit expenditures. This shows just a nice one page summary listing all of the funds, including the general fund that make up our school district budget. And the most important column to look at is that ending fund balance column where you can see that we were able to achieve a balanced budget for all of our funds. Our multi-year projection includes some fairly devastating uh, factors at this point. This is the first year in 2021 that a deficit a factor has been applied since the Great Recession and the first time that a deficit factor has been applied since we've been receiving funding under the local control funding formula. It has been recommended that for our out years, we do project a zero COLA or cost of living adjustment. And as such, those projected years are showing that significant budget reductions may be necessary. But I do wanna point out that this is just a projection, that these numbers will change, but it does provide us a basis for future planning. So to conclude, the district will be able to meet its financial obligations for the upcoming school year, and this budget was built in a very short amount of time. It will come back for your approval on June 18th, and then within 45 days of the state adopting its budget, the district will make any appropriate budget revisions. I did wanna also note that just within the last day or so, the state legislature has passed its own version of the budget and the deficit factor is not included in there. So I'm holding out hope that uh, the budget that the state adopts will be very different than the May revise. And the negotiations, negotiations will now be taking place and the state has an obligation to adopt its budget by June 15th. And with that, I turn it over for board discussion. Thank you, Linnea. So there is hope. This is just a budget on paper and it will come back. Uh, we will have a chance once the, as she said, once the state has adopted its budget, we will have a chance to make 45 days to make any necessary um, changes, hopefully in the positive. Do we have any comments from board members? Uh, Craig. 
is it possible that between now and when school starts, Oops, Chris, you turned your mic off. Oh, sorry. It really depends on what we heard um, yesterday is that state legislature goes through. Um, then, no, we won't need to because the budget reductions will not be, um, will not, that August layoff, we won't be able to meet the qualifications to do an August layoff. Um, so, Linnea is right. She's going to be super busy because as soon as that, uh, the budget is adopted at the state level, we have to revise our budget again. And so things will change for sure. Okay. Any other comments from my colleagues? May I ask a question, please? Yes, Joan. Page eight, potential reductions to balance budget. Um, under the column that says suspended, it says post-employment benefits. And then under transferred in, is that post-employment benefits set aside? Can somebody give me information on what these post-employment benefits are that are bouncing around here? So post-employment benefits are things like for our retirees, we have people who um, still get paid their health after they retire. Um, just other things that after people retire, there are still benefits that the district is paying. And so we have a set aside that we have, a unf we're, we're unfunded right now when we, for the uh, number of people who are retired and what we have in our budget. And so a while back, our board took a action to uh, set aside $500,000, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Linnea, but I think it's $500,000 a year to transfer out of the general fund into post-employment benefits. It's kind of a saving account for us. We suspended that 500000 plus we took everything in there and transferred it back into the general fund. Okay, Joan, does that answer your question? Well, I, I don't, I'm a little lost here because some of those benefits I thought were continuing on. Is, are these benefits including things like the health benefits and the vision benefits and the dental benefits and all those kinds of things? Yes, that is what, um, that is okay. what we pay for. So yeah. Joan, perhaps um, you could have a further well, no, I, I mean, it's it, it, she's exactly right. Those are the benefits that we pay for, and they are continuing on. But what we're saying is, in some ways, they are unfunded at this point. And so we had set aside money to plan for them. So when people retired, we didn't end up in a bind. And it was kind of a savings account for the future of these post-employment benefits that we know are coming in our district. And so... Um, you know, we're just going to have to continue to pay for those as we see and not have that uh, kind of set aside savings account. Thank you. It's kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like our textbooks. You know, we've been saving money along the way because we knew a big adoption was coming. And we had to say, nope, we're going to have to take all our savings and put it back in the budget. And then we'll deal with it when we get there. Thank you. You're welcome. Judy is muted. Judy, you're muted. Oh, my. You're still muted, Judy. The button is just doing weird things. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Moving on to 16C, notice of upcoming bids. Do we have any public uh, speakers on this item? There are no public speakers. Okay. Any board discussion? All right. 17A, Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District's initial proposal to the California School Employees Association, Chapter 302. Office Technical and Business Services Unit and Support Operations Unit exercising provisions of the collective bargaining agreement to sunshine the successor contract for July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2023. No presentation, any public speakers? Madam Superintendent. No public speakers. Thank you. Any discussion from the board? 
Okay. Moving on to A, 18, information. A, California School Board's Annual Education Conference attendance. Um, do we have any public comment on this item? No public comment. Okay. Um, for discussion on this item, this is a, a conference we usually go to and our district has always valued um, uh, the interaction. Professional, professional development was the word I was trying to get out of my mouth. Professional development, and especially uh, professional development is important during this very unusual time. It's also an important time to connect with other school districts to see what they may be doing. However, COVID-19 does present some serious safety issues. And for myself, I um, am going to choose not to attend in person, but I would like to get some discussion from the board, other board members to hear whether how you, whether you plan to attend virtually or you plan to attend in person or comments that you have about the CSBA board conference convention. David, did you have a comment? Oh yeah, no, I was, I'm not. I'm not going okay. to or planning to attend um, physically. I'll attend virtually. The other reason, not only for sake of our, you know, our, our well-being, health-wise, but um, financially, this while, while professional development across all levels is, is there's a cost associated therewith. Um, with what we're facing financially, I think it would be a good idea for those of us who uh, could not go, not to go. Okay. Other comments from board members? Craig? Initially, I uh, assume that, you know, I, I, the risk will be lower in December and I would, why wouldn't I go? But on reflection, um, because we'll be faced with steep budget cuts, uh, unknown at this time, even for between now and when school starts, how deep we'll have to make the cuts. Um, I realize that my participation in the CSBA is only important as it relates to the whole group. It's not a uh, individual benefit thing. It's a whole board benefit thing. And I have little interest uh, in attending it if it's not, uh, if it doesn't grow us as a team, our unity. I don't know if that can really happen this year. And so I don't think I would enjoy some more Zoom meetings in December. Um, take a few days off work every day. I, you know, <laughs> lose a couple hundred dollars every day I miss work or some Zoom conferences that we wouldn't all necessarily be that wouldn't br bring us together so for the budget uh cuts uh reason i'm inclined to and, and if we're not all doing it i'm inclined to not be a part of it this year and just look forward to when it can be again a whole group unifying expense appropriate activity that's where i'm coming from yeah i i, I have a few comments um, I, I personally don't, well, obviously we don't know, uh, what the climate will be like in December. It may be no different than it is right now. It may be worse for all I know. So that said, you know, there's an uncertainty, of course, of course, the conferences have to be planned far ahead of time and attendees have to be planned probably far ahead of time. But, uh, you know, from my perspective, th this could possibly one of the, be one of the more important conferences we attend. Uh, as we explore, we don't know how long these unusual circumstances and teaching and and uh, virtual teaching will will go on, and it may be important that we find out what school districts are doing, that we find out what has worked and what hasn't worked in the short time it's been going on. So, I personally would be inclined that we explore ways that if somebody wants to go, they they should be able to go. Uh, I personally would. You know, have always wanted to attend it. It's uh, it's it's kind of our one of the few teaching opportunities we get to to uh, enrich our own uh, knowledge of you know what boards are doing or what we should be doing or how to do them better. 
and uh, in these particular times, it may be a very important thing to to know how to do what's working better and stay away from what's not working. Uh, that said, though, uh, I want to speak on behalf also of our, our student board member. I, I think it's important that our student board member be able to attend these conferences as well. Uh, you know, to you know, to to be be picked to be on a board is is you know that's one thing. You know, they're elected by their you know by their by their their students, their constituency, but you know, which is a little different than we get elected by our constituents, which is the entire community. But uh, you know, I I think to me as a student board member. This this is where the student board member becomes whole, where they go to this conference and meet up with a hundred or two hundred, or maybe three hundred this year, or however many other student board members, and collaborate within themselves, and if nothing else, just uh, be able to acknowledge that they are these board members, and that the the job is is far far more far more reaching than they realize, and. Uh, you know, I think if you're working in a silo with the district, it's it's pretty hard to see that. We've been there many times, but or some of us have, but our student member only gets to go once once. And uh, you know, that that part of the enrichment of their job is is difficult to reproduce in another way. You know, certainly, you know, that we have some kind of little I don't know, retreat or something and the student board member gets to participate. It's 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 not the same as is it the camaraderie they're gonna they're gonna get and the training they're gonna get on the Brown Act and et cetera, et cetera, that uh, they normally wouldn't get. So I think it's important that, that the student board member goes and and if, if somebody else wants to go, it they should be able to to go. And uh, whether it's done in a different way or uh, you know, whether an attendee has to pay, you know, even uh, pay part of their own, you know, to if they wanna go to their own transportation or whatever, or, you know, I can understand that. But uh, I, I think that it shouldn't be discouraged. And I understand the financial climate. I understand uh, the health climate too. And, and, you know, but I'm speaking, of course, in today's day and today, today I wouldn't go. Uh, next month, I probably wouldn't go. In December, maybe I'd want to go less. But if things are panning out the way we were hoping they'll plan out, or at least we're we're just a, you know, we we don't know. Of course, we we don't have any, we don't have any way to predict what's going to happen. Uh, if it's if the climate is better, I I think that you know this is where we go to learn and become a better board or better board member. So okay. that's what Thank I have. To say. Really, we just need to know um, who wants to register virtually, and who wants to go in person because June eighth. Or June 9th is when we need to know. And so if you could just go through, Judy, and ask the board members their preference right now, um, we'd appreciate it. I think she's frozen. So, uh, <laughs> David Isom? Um, I believe that we can get the enrichment and information and how other school districts are opening and doing their uh, COVID plannings for the future virtually. So I choose not to go. Mr. Wilson. Um, I was hoping for alphabetical, then I'd get to say last. I wanna do what <laughs> everyone else is doing. But if it's not uh, a majority of doing it, I, I don't, I'm not interested. I mean, I don't see enough benefit uh, personally or professionally. If there are new board members, I would hope that they would attend to the maximum possible. But I'm not, you know, the the regular registration deadline is not until November, I know, uh, <laughs> even though it would impose a, uh, it would impose on uh, the people who have to arrange for it to specify that late. But uh, well, it's it's really the in person because if you're in person, you have to get the hotel like immediately. Otherwise, you might not have a place to stay. You might be able to register, but you might not have a place to stay. So that's really um, the in person. So, um, Ms. Scott, I would please. like to go in person, and I'm willing to pay whatever the board, the rest of the board decides should be done. Um, I am very uncapable 
of using all this tech stuff, and I don't see how in the world I'm going to be able to figure that out going to out to L.A. on Zoom or whatever else it is. And honestly, okay. my my special things that I get from that are talking to the people at the tables um, in during during the breaks in between um, the various people that I come into contact from other districts. I learn so much from other people, so I I really do want to go. Great, um, Ms. Smith. I am electing not to go in person. Um, I, I'm sorry, I had an internet snafu and I missed whether um, it was mentioned about a cost for attending virtually. Yeah, there is a cost. It's about $350, I think it is. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's a tenth of the cost that it takes for somebody in person and so, um, Sorry, Chris, I see your lips moving, but I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. You can make that decision to attend virtually later. We don't have to have that um, make those right. arrangements next yeah. week. So, so at this yeah, at this point in time I'm I'm saying no to uh in person. Uh, I think Mr. virtually Silva? is probably gonna be the way to go. Mr. Silva, in person? Yeah, yes, I mean I would like to attend in person, but of course if you know okay. we, we have to see what the climate is like at that time. Well, and maybe things will change, but we'll register you in person. And Mr. Richardson? I decline. And I don't know if Judy's there. Is Honey Church Rita? I think she's frozen and gone, but we'll connect with her. Okay. Thank you. Actually, if I may, because I know we're going to adjournment, I do have one comment, if I may. Is that good? President, the president's not here. Go, go, go. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, to, tonight, I want to take the. Uh, Excuse me. Can everybody hear me now? My, my. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, tonight, I want to take the liberty to uh, thank the uh, the superintendent, the um, executive cabinet, district office staff, and what is now our uh, um, amazing field operation virtual warriors um, our teachers for all of their tireless work and effort um, through this transition um, of learning to the to virtual engagement um, as a member of the uh, governing board i would like to take also a moment to thank the individuals that have stepped up um, at our district office to help us to work efficiently uh, with attention to detail which has been extremely priceless and sought after highly throughout the region tonight. Um, I can't speak for the entire board, but I believe that they would agree with me. Um, I would like to acknowledge Linda Marsh and Martha Pierce, um, which are the executive secretaries to the superintendent. Um, Linda has, has done a phenomenal job from a distance um, with trying to help and also taking care of her health. And hopefully she's on and she can hear this, but if not, we'll tell her to check it out on demand. But we also want to acknowledge uh, Martha for putting on her cape and becoming Super Martha for all of us. Um, to, in addition to the superintendent, um, we could not do what we need to do um, if it had not been um, for her bridging the gap and also doing all that she needs to do to keep us up to date with the requirements that we need for board meetings and our communication with the superintendent. So just want to take this moment to one thank our staff and to also thank those that have helped us to be efficient as board members. I agree with Jonathan and I wanna say a great big thank you. All right, Ms. Honey Church, are you still, are you on? Can you? Her mic button must not be working. So Mr. Silva, do you wanna take it from here? Sure, um, are, are we at uh, adjournment? <laughs> yeah, 21A. Okay. Uh, I think Judy might be back. But if, if, if she's not back completely, uh, I think we need a motion to adjourn the meeting, don't we? Oops. We want to adjourn Maybe in our... memory tonight. <laughs> no, it's uh, Bobby Jean Bennett, the father of Todd Bennett, who's the principal of Laurel Creek Elementary School.
Okay, and I'll, I'll motion that we adjourn the meeting. <laughs> Do we have a second? <laughs> We have a second? second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. All right. Meeting adjourned. Bye. Bye bye.